start recording. Well, let's see here. I think somebody, okay, just let it someone else in. Yeah, so theological anthropology or biblical anthropology, the study of man, not a bad topic. Um, if you take a cultural anthropology class uh, on a college campus, which maybe some of you did a long time ago, that's just studying, that's just stud the study of humans, right? Um, you know, people, you study people from different cultures or social characteristics, um, you know, uh, all different times and places, you know, humanity. So, it you know, it's, it's pretty common to... Um, you know, be able to take a class on a college campus on anthropology, just a basic class. But we're talking about um, biblical anthropology, which is the study of humans as it relates to God. So that's what we're really dealing with. Um, but it's really important. There have been a lot of books written on the topic. Um, from all, you know, just there's actually more and more books coming out all the time. So it's certainly not a topic that isn't uh, isn't being written about within theology. So it's certain, you know, has a lot of there's a lot of interest in it. Um, now, we may say to ourselves, you know, I don't I don't really know what it what the main importance of it is. But if you think about it, you know, we've got we've got a lot of pressing issues in our culture that relates to this, because if you don't know what the nature of humans is or what humans are or anything about the doctrine of humanity, then that impacts everything else. Um, we have a huge, we have a larger movement that's been growing for called transhumanism. Um, there's a lot of people that are into advanced technology and a lot of very wealthy people out there that are putting a lot of money into transhumanism and that's really the goal is to almost help humans to be immortal in a way you know that we can transform our human humanity and uh and through technology you know we can do things to you can use like artificial enhancements you know to something more than human um if you ever I tell you the first movie or first show that I ever really I can looking back I remember the first time I really ever saw something in the base of transhumanism was probably the Six Million Dollar Man. For anybody who really watched that show, remember he had the bionics and they're trying to he's trying to transcend his humanity by adding all these robot robotics inside himself, you know, so it enhanced his strength and everything. You guys, I mean, if you're old enough, you remember that show. Just type in Six Million Dollar Man. Huge, hugely popular show in the 70s. I sat up every Friday night waiting to watch it on TV. I couldn't wait. I'd go in my parents' room with their TV, and I would just wait for it to come on. I was so excited. So um, then they had the bionic woman, of course, as well. So transhumanism is not something that um, is something that is, you know, there's been enough movies that deal with transhumanism. I mean, you know, there's been tons of movies that uh, have humans transcending into something beyond human, um, going beyond their human capacities or else really just transforming into a technolo te technologically advanced human of some kind. So it's not really unheard of. So there's people that are putting millions and millions of dollars into this, you know, trying to, you know, help humans to transcend their own humanity. Um, and then, of course, we have the issue of transgenderism. You know, we still have an issue with transgenderism, a, a big issue, you know, that we uh, have a huge problem with transgenderism. Transgender ideology is still, uh, you know, is quite talked about quite a bit within men's, men and women's sports, um, you know, men and men using women's locker rooms and competing women's sports and people transitioning out of their gender. Um, that has to do with humanity. It has to do with what you think a human is. Okay. It has to do with your view of yourself and what you are and, and human nature and everything. But uh, the transgender issue is getting worse all the time. Um, 
And I've had to deal with it on college campuses because I run into confused college students that are trans. And it's just such a, it's such a, a social phenomenon too. It's a social contagion. You know, people just, it's like trendy almost. So, you know, it's just, it's tragic. It's so tragic. It is beyond tragic. I can't tell you the things that I've had to talk to with trans people, but um, it's very sad. But that has to do with an issue of what we're talking about tonight. Um, we had two people in the latest um, administration, you know, that are trans. We have one right here, serves as secretary, assistant secretary. Um, that's one. Um, and then we had another one that got fired, um, apparently for trying to steal luggage or something, whatever he is. He calls himself they. But, um, you know, we have uh, the celebration of transgender ideology and the push towards everything you can do to transition into whatever you want to be. Um, so that is out there. No doubt is going to be out there. So, um, you know, that that's an issue. You know, when you're when you're dealing with people that have been very impacted by postmodernist anthropology, what I mean by that is postmodernism is a view that um, the, the the people it's it's all around us. I mean, it's just it's the thinking that people have. It's a view that your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, or else there's no truth, or else everything's from your perspective. Social everything's a social construct. Um, gender is a social construct. Um, everything's a social construct. So. You know, it's basically human nature can be defined whatever you want it to be. Okay, it's de it's defined independently of us, and we're free whatever it means. We're free to define whatever it means to be human. Okay, whether it means individually or collectively. So it's fluid, and it's all up for grabs. Okay, everything is fluid. It's not fixed. Um, you know, it can be changed and adapted, and everything is up for grabs. So that's probably not going away. Um, certainly see the results of that. That's why we have a lot of transgenderism. We have a lot of other issues too, because of what we call postmodernist anthropology. Now, we know that, um, you know, as I've said before, the first question kicking off biblical anthropology is whether we're created or not. And, you know, as I've said before, you have Richard Dawkins, who says the opposite of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He was, he's a very famous, well-known atheist. He's a biologist. He's written a lot of books, but um, staunch atheist. But, you know, he says that we're just DNA in motion, basically. So that's the reason we live and we just propagate DNA. And that's our sole reason for living, just to make more copies of the same DNA. And that's a big contrast, of course, from Genesis 1, 26 to 28 about being made in the image of God. If you look at this guy, Will Prov uh, William Provine's views, before he passed away, he had cancer. But this is, you know, like a very, uh, the opposite of the starting point of the Bible. You know, what are humans, what we are. I mean, he says here, let me summarize my views and what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. Then these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposes, and no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That is the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning of life, and no free will for humans. What an unintelligible idea. So whatever um, he believed, he found out because he's gone now. So, But anyway, that's a view of... Um, Biblical anthropology without God, or, or anthropology without God at all. Um, James Sire, uh, you know, he wrote this famous book, which is, I think he's on the eighth edition now. It's called The Universe Next Door. But, you know, he wrote this, the, the worldview of the books about worldview, this was like one of the big ones, still is, and he says our worldview is a set of presuppositions about the basic makeup of the world. So as we know, a worldview is a lens to reality. And so we, everybody has a worldview, you're formulating your worldview. Um, 
people's worldview are impacted by their family, by their faith, of course, by experience, life experience, by relationships, by education. But everybody has a worldview. Now, some people aren't aware of their worldviews. They're not even aware of it. But for us as Christians, we have to have a thought-out worldview. We have to have a robust worldview. Um, your worldview should impact the way you do everything because your faith is a worldview. Christianity is a worldview. It's a way of viewing reality. So it should impact all you do. It should impact your relationship. It should impact your time. It should impact your, how you spend your money. It should impact how you vote. It should impact your um, positions on social issues. It should impact what goals you have in life, um, everything starts with your worldview. So with a worldview, you know, the, the, the anthropology question as far as, you know, how do we view ourselves is probably the first question of all questions. I mean, there's several worldview questions, but that's one of the most important ones, of course. You know, how do we get or what are we? I mean, you know, the, the other three are all tied into that one. You can't know... If you don't know what we are, you can't know how to what to do about the world around us, and you can't know where we're headed as a human race, and you can't know right from wrong. So they all tie in together to this. They all tie into that first question. Now, we know that, um, sorry, we know the scripture in Genesis 1, 26 to 27 says that we're made in God's image and his likeness. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate about what that means exactly. But we know that image signifies a copy, which which kind of also carries the idea of a representation. So it's something that's patterned after the original. So when it comes to humans, we are patterned after God. We're a representation of him. Okay, that doesn't mean we are God, of course, but we're made in his image. We're made in the likeness of God. So Remember, the image of God is a phrase that's only applied to us as humans, okay? Humanity is the pinnacle of creation. We are not just animals. We're not like animals, and we're on the same plane as animals. We are above the animal kingdom, okay? We are distinguished from the rest of earthly creation. So we are supposed to, we are like the original creator in some way. And there has been, but written like, like God in some way. Now, we're not divine, of course. We're creating the image of likeness, right? Now, there are certainly consequences of being made in the image of God, okay? Because if all every human being is made in the image of God, male and female alike, that applies to every ethnicity. Um, and we know that in Genesis, God made distinct male and female. Um, in the Bible, they don't really make a big distinction between sex and gender, okay? They don't go around saying, what's your gender, okay? They're they're kind of just synonymous with each other, right? Which we've kind of gotten away from today because we, we, we divide those in two because now we say gender, gender is an expression of your biological sex. I mean, which it is, but what we're telling people is your gender expression does not need to match your biological sex. So if you're a biological male and you want to express yourself as a female, that's fine. Or if you're born a biological female and you want to express yourself as a male, that's fine, right? Whereas it used to be that your gender expression matched your biological sex. But even after the fall of man in Genesis 3, um, people, even though they fell, even though the ha that happened, you know, in the garden account, we're still made in the image of God. We still possess the image and likeness of God. It's not like God wiped it away from us and said, no, you're, longer, you're no longer made in my image. We're still made in his image. But we just need to be renewed in the image of God through the person of Jesus Christ. We're being renewed according to the image um, of God through Jesus. That's what the New Testament talks about. And Jesus is the only one who perfectly has imaged God. Jesus is the perfect representation of God, and he, he represents God. He images God perfectly. We're called the image God as well. We just can't do it the way Jesus did it because we still, we still have sin in our lives. Even though we can, we can have forgiveness and atonement for sins, we still sin sometimes. Jesus never sinned, and he won't sin. 
So now when it comes to um, being made in the image of God, of course, this was the basis, has been the basis for all kinds of human rights and the recognition that humanity has dignity. Um, that's why after 1948, I mean, after the Holocaust, I'm sorry, um, a lot of these human rights declarations came around. The human, United Nations issued a declaration of human rights in 1948, which says all human beings are born equality and dignity. Um, this, in 1966, there was two other documents, um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, became known as the International Bill of Rights. And all these documents maintain the various human rights of their grounding, the dignity of all humans. Well, where are you going to get the dignity of all humans? You only can say humans all have dignity if they're made in the image and likeness of God. It can't be based on human opinion. Otherwise, Hitler was, Hitler found that some human beings don't have dignity and other people do think they have dignity. Um, you know, you, you have to have a grounding point that's universal and that has to come from God. Um, now... There was other countries, you know, that came up with all these human rights definitions, but they all basically said the same thing, that human dignity is a fundamental value. Okay, now, I don't know how people find humans having dignity without being made in the image and likeness of God. They try to say that, well, you know, I can just assign dignity to someone. It's just, we just know people have dignity. Well, why do they have dignity? Well, we just think they do. That's that's a circular argument. You're not telling me why they do. What grounds their dignity? Why? why? Um, so the Genesis 1 text about all humans being made in the image and likeness of God has grounded the basis for human dignity for a long time, and so still will. Because, you know, the question becomes, you know, do we have intrinsic value, dignity, and rights because we bear the image of a personal God? Notice I said intrinsic. That's not extrinsic. That's something inherent okay just like the declaration of independence says we have unenalable rights unenalable rights so we um we have intrinsic value dignity and rights based on god's endowment he endowed that on us and we were created just for the sake of being created we have that endowment he endowed us with intrinsic value dignity and rights okay so we are not an accident of nature and a f only the higher form of an animal. And the highest authority we have is not to each other. And, sci and science is not the ultimate way to know everything. It's a good way, but not the only way. Um, so, you know, this plays a huge role in how we're going to navigate reality and how we deal with these big issues and, and what are, how, why do humans have dignity, right? Now, the other thing is that if you, um, you know, if you say humans only have dignity or value because of their function, that gets kind of dicey because some people think that, um, you know, human, you're basically human if you have certain capacities. That means if you have consciousness and, and reasoning and self-motivated activity, the capacity to communicate, the presence of self-awareness. Um, so, you know, this plays a huge role in the debate over abortion because some people say these, that the unborn have, I'm sorry, the, uh, at conception, you know, the human, the unborn have the potential to have these things, but they're not really a person yet. Okay. They're not a person until they have these capacities. Okay. Um, now I think we know that most humans don't all have the same functions. They don't have the same capacities. I mean, some of us don't reason as well as others. Some of us may have abilities that other people don't have. Um, so it's really hard to have a functionalist view of humans, okay? Defining personhood by function, okay? Because, you know, you could have people that are in comas. You could have infants. You could have people that have some sort of major health issue that don't fit the criteria for person or a, a, a function, a functionalist view. They don't meet the criteria for personhood. So that's not going to work. Um, 
guy like Peter Singer here, he's really, really bizarre and really, really extreme, but um, teaches at Princeton, teaches bioethics. Like he is, he accepts like a functionalist view of humans um, and a functionalist view of personhood. He says that in order to say someone's a human, they have to have the capacity to see themselves as a continuing subject. They have to have a desire to keep living. They have to have the capacity to make choices and act on them. They have to have self-awareness and they have to have the ability to experience pain. Um, of course, there's other members, other species that have these things, such as apes and dolphins. Um, and sadly, um, he thinks that though they need just as much protection. They need even more protection sometimes as a human does. Um, but he thinks they, they need these are more or I'm sorry, more more protection, moral protection than a uh a human um uh a human growing in your mother in the mother's womb, um, or an infant. So he thinks that if, if an inf human fetus or infant lacks those traits, then they're not really um, you know, they're not really qualifying as having personhood. So he allows for infanticide um abortion and infanticide you know infanticide is, of course being able to kill your child after it's born um because they have to have these four capacities so that's pretty extreme but it shows you how this really plays a role right now what we're saying is that our personhood the way god made is defined by our essence or nature we all have a nature we all share an essence and we all have a nature okay and this was given to us at birth, and it's intrinsic, and it, it goes on throughout life. We're not potential persons or becoming persons. We are persons by our very nature, okay? We, we are a person the moment we are conceived, okay? I mean, as soon as we find out, you know, whenever, it's the moment we're conceived at conception, we receive our entire DNA code, um, we... You know, we are not so we're not just like becoming persons. Okay. That's that's the whole pro-abortion argument, which doesn't work. Okay. Now, Genesis 9, 6, by being created in God's image, um, similar to James 3, 9, it condemns cursing people since they're made in the image and likeness of God. Um that's why capital punishment is an appropriate penalty for murder. And then, as I said, people, even though after the fall of man, they still bear the image of God. Okay. It's the image of God is certainly distorted in us because we don't act like image bearers, but the image of God is still there. Now there's been different ways to try to figure out what that means to, um, just a little elaboration more on what it means to what it means to be made in the image of God. There's been a few views out there on how to define that. Like some people think, well, being it me, if I'm made in God's image, does that mean like God has a body? Cause I have a body. Does that mean God has eyes? Cause I have eyes. Does that mean God's this? Cause I have, that's not what that means. Okay. Um, in the Bible, we know that anthropomorphisms are used to describe God, right? They're not literal. Like it says, God outstretches his arm, his eyes see everything. That's, doesn't mean God has literal eyes and literal arms um, like we do. But one view of being made in the image of God means that we're given some of the same communicable attributes that God has. Like God's intelligent, he's creative, he has, he's with, you know, he is wisdom, he's loving, he's compassionate, he's moral, he's holy, he's just. We can People can see these things in us, and all humans, we have these attributes. We're very, some of us obviously are more creative than others, um, you know, we, but we are creative. We have intelligence. We can do reasoning. We can show wisdom, love, compassion, holiness, justice, et cetera. Because, so that's one view. The way we're made in the image of God is by the capacity or the, um, the attributes we have, just as God has, some of those things God has. Um Another view is that, um, oh, yeah, and so that ties in with being made in the image of a personal God. Remember, God is a personal God, and so to be personal means that 
God would have to have rationality, self-consciousness, and volition. That, that's your will, by the way. That's what volition means, to have a will. And these are the kind of qualities that are associated with being a person. And so we as humans display these characteristics, which we do. Um, now, there's another view, what it means to be made in the image of likeness of God. And that's called the relational view. Okay, and that means that uh, just like God's a trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they're in perfect relationship with each other, that we are relational beings. We relate to other people, and we relate to God, but that is being made in his image. That's why humans are naturally very relational. Now, granted, some of us have to work at it, but the point is that we're made and created to flourish in relationships, just like the way God, as the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they're a perfect, they're in perfect relationship with each other, and we model that, and we we desire that because we're made in God's image. Okay, that's why we don't do well when we're isolated. We tend to not flourish as humans. We saw that during COVID. Um, so we're designed to be in community. We're designed to have relationships. All those things. So that's a that's another view. Another view is to be made in God's image is the rulership view. And that means that when God created his image, he charges us with the authority to rule and subdue the earth. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we, um, you know, go to war and we like physically say, I'm taking over the world for God. And we like beat people up and build, try to build physical kingdoms. Uh, you know, that's not what that means. Um, it just means that we're God gives us the task to manage the world as his representatives. Okay, we are given that authority. Okay, and so we're supposed to procreate and we're called to manage the world that God's given us. Now, um, so all, by the way, all three of those views all have good points to them. I don't think you necessarily have to hold the one, but they all seem to make some sense so you could hold all three if you want um does have to be one does have to be excluded from the other now um we talk a little about the body soul and spirit in the bible we're talking about cult, we're talking about biblical anthropology is studying like what is a man so the bible has different terms for us and what we are and if you can get this um book anthropology of the old testament that's a starting point of course there's anthropology of the new testament as well but um let me mention spirit first because that comes the hebrew word ruach the ruach um we say the ruach hakodesh um that's the holy spirit but it were you know when you think of that word ruach in the old testament the ruach it just trying to get the little on there um it's a term that refers to the wind um in refer of course you know there's it talks about the spirit of god but you know you can read that like in ezekiel 37 with the vision of the dry bones right where the spirit brings those bones to life so obviously a lot of us when we think of spirit we think of life of course right i'll go back to this in deeper detail um and then you have for the word soul it's nephesh and it can have various meanings. Um, in Psalm 105, 18, it says his nephesh was put into irons. Um, sometimes the nephesh has bodily desire, appetite for food and drink, breath and sex. Sometimes it simply means a vital principle of, or life force. The nephesh, the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? And sometimes nephesh can stand for the whole person, which I'm going to talk about more. So don't worry. I'll go back to these in greater detail. Um, let me just mention that the heart, before I go back to soul and spirit. So the heart, um, it refers to all of you in the Bible. It comes from love or lavad in the in New Testament. It's called cardia. And that basically means your entire being, everything. Your emotions, your thoughts, your will. Your, your actions, everything. Like when you say, say, I love God with all my heart, or God talks about a heart for, you know, people having a heart for God. It's all of you. It's the totality of who you are, right? Now, today, we define 
in today's culture, we define the heart as mostly like inner feelings. When we say, like I said last week, follow your heart, just follow your heart. People are talking about simply uh, the inner part of them, you know, the desires they have, but that's not biblically what heart is in the Bible. That's not what that means. Now, when it comes to um, the words that describe um, with like uh, things that animate a living thing, like things that have to do like the breath of God or an act of breathing, when it talks about humans and animals possessing life, that these terms are used that animate a living thing, whether it be a human or an animal. Okay, you've got the Ruach again, the spirit. And then you've got the Nefesh in some passages as well, both soul and spirit. Remember, spirit is Ruach and the soul is Nefesh. Um, but, you know, when it says Genesis 2, 7, you know, God breathed, uh, they became a life-giving soul, whatever, I'm kind of paraphrasing, they're life-giving soul. And then there's sometimes Ruach and Nefesh are used to describe one's inner life. It can be the seat or source of emotion sometimes, once again. So it's used in that way as well. Um, yeah, I can't look up all these passages right now. We don't have time. But even the Ruach and the Nefesh are related to all these issues in the Bible. Um, enthusiasm, will, the volitional will of humans, decision-making capacity, attitudes, inner disposition, self-awareness. So now, biblically, I think that what, what happens is it gets a little confusing sometimes because it seems like when you look up the word soul, which is nephesh, it seems to refer to the animation of life and the inner life, but it also refers at times to the whole person. Like the entire you, like if I say, if I say you poor soul, oh, Eric is a poor soul or uh, Susie, oh, Susie, that poor soul, poor soul. You're talking about them, right? You're talking about her. You're talking about me. You're talking about the entire person, right? It's not like part of me. You're saying I am a soul, right? I'm, in, I'm a whole person. And sometimes that's, that does come out in the Bible as well where it seems like there is a reference to like basically the, the nephesh referring to the whole person. Um, there's some passages that have body and soul together. And it is true that only the nephesh, the soul can encompass the totality of a human, the ruach, um, the spirit, only generally refers to the inner life and all its capacities. Um, it's not necessarily distinct from the nephesh, but nephesh can refer to inner life. But ne nephesh is only confer the totality of a human, and heart as well is used that way. When you say like the heart, that can refer to our all of us. Now, um, let me skip this. I'm sorry. Okay. By the way, so let me go a little bit more on the issue of the soul. Um, this was uh, from a long time ago in 2001. A guy named Michael Kinsley, who used to be on the news all the time. I don't even know what he's doing now. I'm not sure if he's still around. But there's an article in Time magazine which featured an article defending stem cell research on human embryos. And he said, these embryos are microscopic groupings of a few differentiated cells. There's nothing human about them except potential if you choose to believe it is soul. So there you go. It says basically, we're just uh, a clump of cells. Well, guess what? We're all clumps of cells. Every human being is a clump of cells. We just have a lot of cells. Okay. So you could say that I'm still a clump of cells, but that doesn't mean that I'm not um, a human. And it doesn't mean I just have potential. And same thing with the unborn, with the, uh, the person in the womb. Okay. Now, remember that um, in the New Testament, that um, sometimes what you begin to see is that the soul and words for soul and spirit kind of work interchangeably together. Like sometimes 
it'll say the soul of death, you know, like the soul departs. Sometimes it talks about the spirit departing. For example, it says, you know, when Rachel died in Genesis 35, 18, it says her soul was departing for she died. And then Isaiah predicts that the servant of the Lord would pour out his soul to death. That's his nephesh. See, right? The Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, right? And then in the New Testament, like it says, God tells the rich fool this night, your soul is required of you. And then in some cases, you know, you'll see that spirit is used. You know, Jesus says on the cross, says into the, your hand, I commit my spirit, the pneuma. That's a Greek word for spirit, pneuma. And he says at death, the spirit returns to God who gave it in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then Jesus says he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So in some cases, you'll see spirit and soul used interchangeably. Um, it, it's clear that, you know, some, some verses indicate they are different from each other. Um, the soul seems to be like the life force that causes the brain, the heart, and the organs to breathe and function and maintain the body. Um you know, obviously it's possible when our, you know, when our spirit is present, the soul is operating the body to function. So scripture speaks of the soul ceasing to exist. It exists, it ceases to exist because the spirit has departed from our bodies. Okay. You know, I think there's a passage in the Bible that says without the spirit, the body is dead or the body is, you know, something like that. Um, so if you've ever seen someone pass away in front of you, like I have you, I've, it's almost like they're uh, something left them. You can just see it. Um, so they're used interchangeably at times. And it seems like, um, you know, then some people say, well, you know, it seems like a human being's composed of two parts or three parts. Which is it? I mean, are we a body and an immaterial soul or are we composed of three parts, a body, a soul, and spirit? Which is it? I mean, some passages, it seems like we're just a body and an immaterial soul. In other passages, it seems like there's the body, the soul, and the spirit, which is it? I know you guys think about this all day long. Um, and that's why, you know, some people try to give proof text. A proof text is something where you quote something out of context to make a point. You take like a passage of scripture, like 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that's in the context of First Thessalonians chapter 5 and in the context of the entire book of First Thessalonians. But Paul says, now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's an argument for three of us or three parts. You know, are we spirit, soul, and body? Because it seems like Paul seems to say that. And then, you know, it says in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the Ruach, right? And man became a life, be a living being. Or that can be translated as soul. You know, so it's a little confusing at times. So my view is that... Um, Scripture never explains completely how the body, soul, and spirit work together. Um, if Scripture is silent, we are best to keep quiet and not try to come up with weird views and trying to make the text fit what we want it to say. Um, but we cannot, with confidence, claim to know the difference between the term soul and spirit as used in the Bible. We can have some understanding, but it's still a little confusing. Okay, and so... I don't think we should try to force one view over the other, but um, there's definitely some argument we could say there's some sort of integration between the spirit, the soul, and the body. Everything is holistic, meaning that we are personal, spiritual, physical wholes, single beings consisting of different aspects, parts, dimensions, and abilities that are not naturally independent or separable. And I think, as you know, as they've shown in even the sciences and psychology or um, even just phys physically speaking, you know, if we're not well in one area, it impacts the other. If we're not spiritually well, it impacts our mental abilities. It impacts our bodies. If we're not well physically, it impacts our mental abilities. If we're not well 
mentally, it impacts the rest of our being. Everything's kind of integrated together. So that's why we should probably view ourselves as holistic, you know, that we're the God has all these things working together. Um, there's been a lot of books written about the soul, plenty of arguments for the soul. Um, most Christians have what's called a traditionally as a dualistic view, meaning that they think that the soul is a immaterial thing different from the body and the brain. So our core personalities, if you want to label them as if you want to label us as souls, spirits, persons, cells, or egos, are distinct. Um, and can exist independent of our body. So when you guys, you know, 99% of Christians or probably the large majority of us, when someone dies or we have a near-death experience, which are very, very well documented, is that something about us departs from our body. And we're able to separate from our body and still uh, be aware well, I should say, when we die, I mean, I don't think we're aware of our body anymore, but I'm saying that near-death experiences seems that people are able to look down at their bodies in the hospital rooms and see their bodies sitting there. But something about us seems to be able to, um, we can be dis what we call disembodied. So we can separate from the body temporarily. And so, you know, if you want to, give a definition of the soul, which is in J.P. Moreland's book here, which I have, he says the soul is a substantial unified reality that informs and gives form to its body. The soul is to the body like God is the space that is fully present at each point within the body. The soul and the body relate to each other in cause and effect way. So in a dualistic view, we see man composed of mind and body, the mental and the physical, or we could say the anthropological things we've been talking about, soul and body, or spirit and body, okay? And so most of the time, um, oh, by the way, it, I found this in psychology today. So this is interesting. This is from an online article called, Does the Soul Exist? The Evidence Says Yes. This is in psychology today uh, from online. This author says it is said to be the ultimate Animating principle by which we think and feel, but it isn't dependent on the body. Many infer its existence without scientific analysis or reflection. Indeed, the mysteries of birth and death, the play of consciousness during dreams or after a few martinis, and even the common most mental operations such as imagination and memory, suggest the existence of a vital life force existing independent of the body. And, you know, it's true that, do you know that probably the majority of humans throughout the history of mankind um, in all countries, all places from childhood believe we have a soul. It's so ingrained in people because it's so intuitive that kids that um, don't believe in a soul have to be talked out of it by their parents, like in a rush, like in a communistic country, like China or Russia or somewhere else. They have to be like, taught early early on you know they they don't have a soul because it's so intuitive to believe in a soul and like i said it's otherwise no it's just taken for granted by most people okay that there's something about us that isn't fully physical okay you know as george mcdonald said you don't have a soul you are a soul you have a body um you know, personhood, I'm sorry, I should say personhood is not only based on having a body, a soul is what is required. So we know that people are referred to as souls. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people out in the world that claim to be physics. I mean, I say a lot. I don't know if they're, they're not the majority, but there's certainly people out there that are only physicalists or materialists, and they think that all things and events in the world consist of physical stuff and operate according to physical laws. So there is no immaterial part of reality. You are just um, following the laws of physics and you're just chemicals in motion, your matter in motion, and you're just a giant moist robot. 
You're just a physical thing. There's nothing immaterial about you. That's what some people believe. Um, needs a lot of evidence to back that up, but that's what some people believe. Now, it is true that um, uh, there is a um, issue about in neuroscience today. And if you go to college campuses like I do, you deal with kids that are taking neuroscience as a major, which it's kind of a popular major these days. Um, but a lot of times you take neuroscience, you get into neuroscience. A lot of people think that uh, the mind and the brain are basically um, the same thing. And so what I mean by that is you have your brain, which is physical, of course, the physical properties. But in Christianity, um, generally speaking, uh, I should say most in most cases, we do not think the brain and the mind are the same thing. The mind is the part of you that is your soul. It's the consciousness part of you that is not physical. Okay, so they're distinct from each other. The mind and the brain are distinct from each other. Okay, um, they can interact with each other. But they, they can also operate independently of each other. And so consciousness, you know, you have like subjective thoughts and feelings and experience and desires, um, your dreams, your people have near-death experiences. That part of you is distinct from the brain, okay? The brain, but in, if you take a neuroscience class today on a college campus, the general view is they'll, they'll tell students is that the brain and the mind are not distinct from each other. You're just a brain, really, um, because everything's physical, because most college campuses are run by two worldviews, and it's uh, they're run by physicalism, materialism, that everything's physical. So um, that's why when Sharon Dick, Dirk, she wrote this book um, called... Um, Am I just my brain? She's a neuro Christian neuroscientist. She says, "Does you are you are just your brain? Explain the world around us. A large part of who I am comes from an unseen inner life, consisting of thoughts, memories, emotions, and decisions. None of which are captured by cell voltages, neurotransmitters, and blood flow changes. You are just your brain. In instinctively fails to explain the inner me. Excuse me." <clears throat> You know, there's a story about a woman named Pam Reynolds who had a brain hemorrhage in 1991. So she was clinically dead. And when she was resuscitated, by the way, there's a lot of stories like this, but I'm just bringing up this one because this is a good one. But she said, they said that when the operation was successful and she was resuscitated, that Pamela recalled being conscious during the surgery. So, you know, that's where, um, you know, that's a case where somebody was able to somehow separate from their body during the surgery or, and, and watch, see what's going on in the operating room. They can, when they come back after the surgery, they can recall things that were going on during the surgery, which would be impossible if they were dead. Okay, how would they know this happened and that happened? How would they know the name of the nurse that came in during surgery? How would they know this person walked in and out? How would they know so many things if they were supposedly dead? Well, Pamela was conscientious. Con she was because she was still she had separated from her body and had near death experience, and she experienced all those things being separated from her body. And there's a lot of obviously testimonies about this kind of stuff. I did a Zoom call. I did two Zoom calls on your death experiences. I had uh, this book right here. This I author of both these books lecture on it, Stephen Miller. Um, and uh, he has a lot of documentation in these books on near death experiences. They're well documented. They're not like hokey pokey, weird kind of um, goofy stuff, new age stuff. So there is some decent evidence out there and some and some pretty good evidence, you know, in some cases, really good evidence that all across the world, all different cultures, all different places, people having near death experiences. So if those things are true, then you're definitely not just a physical being. I mean, there's something about you that can separate from you when you die 
and can come back to your body. But obviously that would mean that we're not just uh, matter in motion. You know, we're not just, we can't be just have a physical outlook of everything. <laughs> now, it is true that um, some natural, or I'm sorry, some near-death experiences could be fabricated. Um, you know, you you can't rule out the possibility of some other things, but the point is that when someone's in surgery, you know, the blood supply to their heart and brain you know, has been temporarily ceased to enable surgery. So something's going on there. And I think that if you get deeper into both of those books, you, you get more, a lot more, it's very interesting. Okay. Now remember that um, when it comes to neuroscience, it's a it's a really interesting field and it can be a wonderful tool but um it doesn't really it can't really detect whether you have a soul or not it's not set up to do that because the soul is something that would be immaterial and neuroscience only studies physical things and material things so it'd be really hard to detect whether there's an immaterial part of you that is a soul right um it's really all they can do is really show the correlation between the mind and the brain, but they they can't really show they're identical. So once again, let me go back here again, explain this. So when we're talking about you, you have a brain and you have a mind. They're not the same thing. Okay. The mind is the part of you that is not physical. That's your consciousness, which isn't physical. That's your soul. That's that, that area, okay? Your brain is certainly over there, but they can interact with each other, okay? So if you're only just a brain, then there wouldn't be any, that wouldn't be, you know, that, that wouldn't line up, of course, biblically. It also wouldn't line up with what we know in philosophy. Now, of course, if Jesus is who he is and God is who he is, then yes, game set match over we uh we know that we're more than physical things we know that jesus rose from the dead and will rise from the dead as well um there's a guy named thomas nagel he's a uh, philosophy professor in new york university he wrote a book called mining mining and cosmos he said why the materialist neo-darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false he says the modern materialist he's not even a christian by the way He's, I think he's like an agnostic. He says the modern materialist approach to life has conspicuously failed to explain such central mind related features of our world, such as consciousness, intentionality, meaning, and value. So basically saying this whole view of everything being physical, you know, the Darwinism is completely true that there's no gods, no immaterial part of us is ridiculous. Um, it doesn't, the evidence for consciousness is too strong. Now, um, of course, you know, when you get to issues of when we die, you know, what happens, I think, obviously, as we know, the most traditional view is that, is what we call um, the interme intermediate state view, is that we're, um, you know, we separate from our body temporarily, and we're with God a temporary amount of time, and then we're resurrected later on. When Jesus comes back, we get a resurrected body down the line. Um, some people think that, when we die, we may have an intermediate body of some kind, um, because when you see the passage of Matthew 17 with Moses and Elijah, they're on the they're on the mountain with Jesus, and they can be seen some sort of physical thing there. It's not like a ghost floating around. There seems to be something that resembles them physically, even though we don't know exactly what it looks like. But some people think that they're in some sort of intermediate body of some kind until the final resurrection body. And then there's another passage in Revelation 6 there. So some people view that, that, you know, we have some sort of intermediate body. Maybe I get my hair back. I don't know. Um, the other is, another view out there is that when we die, we just go to sleep. That uh, basically we're not conscientious of where we are. We just go to sleep. Okay. And so we're not really in heaven or hell. We're just sleeping. And then in the resurrection, when Jesus comes back and everyone, the, the full resurrection happens of all the people across 
the universe across humanity are resurrected, then we are judged either to be with Jesus or not be with Jesus. And then, of course, if we're Christians, you know, we're resurrected forever to life. But if we're not believers, we're resurrected to damnation and judgment. So that's another view out there. I don't think there's really good evidence for that one. Um, I think the best evidence is that we separate from our bodies when we die temporarily. Maybe we have an intermediate body, but the point is we separate from our bodies temporarily, and then we are um, given a new resurrection body later on. So that's the most traditional view as well. Um, do animals have souls? I assume they have a soul, but an animal soul is not a human soul. It's not the same thing. Animals do not bear the image of God. Only humans do. So, you know, people ask me sometimes, are animals in heaven and do animals have souls? I really don't know. Um, but there is a life force within animals. You know, they're animated. You know, animated means they have life. So there's something that is giving them their life force. But the point is that um, I, they're not the same as humans. Okay, they can't be redeemed. They don't need the gospel. We don't need to worry. Oh, they're not in heaven. I mean, that's totally, the Bible doesn't talk about it, so don't worry about it. Um, these people that are obsessed with seeing their animal one day, their pet one day. I, I really don't know for sure, and I'm not going to act like I do, but if the Bible's silent about it, why get stressed out about it? Um, but some people are like that. Okay, so I think that we need to remember a couple things, takeaway points. One, the stress on being made in the image and likeness of God is a huge issue, obviously. Um, stressing that to other humans, uh, communicating that. Second thing is that, um, you know, there's different terms for us used in the Bible for humans, body, soul, spirit, um, heart. Um, there's a relationship between all of them, but at the end of the day, I don't really know if we know for sure exactly how the soul and the spirit interact with each other. They're both there in scripture. Um, like I said, they're used interchangeably, but I don't really know. I mean, I know I have the Holy Spirit in me and then is the Holy Spirit, you know, just there inside me. And then I've got my life force, the soul, which is there and then i've got my body you know i'm an animated body by a soul and then the spirits there i i don't know how those all work together i don't um how, i know there's an integration there of some kind but i don't know um perfectly i know when we say sometimes our soul is grieved you know, that just means we're grieved right we're just i'm grieving this is the way we say it you know kind of like our soul is grieved or my spirit is grieved by which you know my spirit is grieved you know, it's just another way of saying that, you know, if you're a believer, you're the, the spirit in you is grieved, you know, because you have God's spirit in you. Say, my spirit's grieved. I'm talking about from a, being a believer's perspective. But anyway, I don't know how much anybody's thought about any of these things, but um, I do think that um, for the sake of transgenderism and the sake of transhumanism, which is growing every day, that we need to have a pretty good handle on these things. Okay. All right, that'll be about it.